Chapter 8 On the Road to Averheim Near the town of Streisand, Averland, 378 miles from Altdorf. The way to Averheim was paved with misery and hopelessness. The closer they got to the capital, the more frequently they came across bedraggled regiments in Averland black and yellow. In truth, they were scraps of soldiers. Most were deserters or utterly routed troops. Encountered at a distance on the opposite side of the Aver, the broken merely trudged onwards, aimless and despairing. Those on the same side of the river fled like scared rabbits when they saw the column of Reichland troops. They wanted neither succor nor aid, instead fearing to be pressed into service by another lord. Many were wounded. Some carried dead and injured comrades over their shoulders, ignoring the stench of gangrene and decomposition. There were human refugees, too, alone and alongside the broken Averland troops, much like the ones the foot regiments had met earlier when Stoller was still in command. Dower priests of Moor walked with them, ministering to the dead and dying, flocks of ravens shadowing their every step. Amongst the copse of trees, the army scouts found a trio of hanged soldiers. From the scattered rocks beneath their dangling, bootless feet, it appeared they had committed suicide. Two more Averlanders were found slumped against the bole of the hanging tree. Their wrists were slit, and bloody daggers lay in their dead hands. Evidently, the desperate men had run out of hope for all five of them, and didn't want to cut down the others to reuse what they had. Mercifully, the army did not meet any more orcs, nor did it stop at any other villages, empty or not. Deserters, refugees and suicides were not their only encounters, however. Late into the evening, just before the captains announced they would break camp, a single rider and a ragged band of followers on foot joined them, having come from the west. Karlik shuddered inwardly when he recognized the same witch-hunter from Hobbskleyn. The man had almost forty degenerates in tow. Around half were armored to the hilt and carried an assortment of weapons. An eclectic mix, including a pair of dwarves and several dark-skinned men foreign to the Empire. They could be nothing other than mercenaries. The rest were made up of flagellants and seekers, the latter being the homeless, pitiless wretches who had lost everything to the dark creatures that predated on the innocent and weak, and only longed for vengeance or death. Dangerous men all, but nothing compared to their mounted leader. In search of gold and retribution, remarked Volker from the second rank, when he noticed Karlik looking at them. The Grimblades marched in column, three files wide, like the rest of the foot regiments. They were midway down the order of march, unfortunately, right behind the steel swords. Aye, Karlik replied, keeping his feelings hidden from the men. Not a good combination. Parasites and degenerates, muttered Rex to the sergeant's right, spitting out a goblet of phlegm. Undesirable allies indeed, noted Lankman. All faithful men are soldiers of Sigmar, said Masbrecht. We should not judge them harshly for that. Rex glared over his shoulder at the man. Shut up, Masbrecht. No one cares what you think. Both of you be quiet, snapped Karlik, quickly nipping the situation in the bud before it could develop. Silence until we break camp, he added afterwards. The witch-hunter and his soldiers of faith joined the rear of the column, happiest with the militia companies and baggage train. Runners informed the prince of their presence. Encouraged by Father Wunterwasch, Wilhelm tolerated them. He needed every man he could get if he was to lift the siege over Averheim. Once they were out of sight, the rest of the army almost forgot about them. All except Karlik, that is. The image of the witch-hunter, attired in black and carrying his silver talisman like a death warrant, was burned into his mind. 
he could no more forget the man's presence than he could his own name. Was it just war and suffering that had drawn him to them? Or did the Templar of Sigmar ride the plains of Averland for another reason? Was he, in fact, looking for someone? Karlik did not consider himself to be a paranoid man. He met fate head-on, and didn't look over his shoulder for shadows in the night. The appearance of the witch-hunter from Hobbskline had changed all that. Baron Ernst Blaislocker lolled in his saddle like an overweight clown. His steed, a stubby-legged mare, was as bulky as her master. Its bright yellow caparison hurt the eyes if looked at too long. Rings filled the Baron's fat fingers, and a great golden amulet rested on his breastplate, which stuck out on account of his girth. A peppering of stubble swathed his triple chins, but made him look neither swarthy nor rugged. All it actually did was to reinforce the Baron's gluttonous image. His yellow and black tunic, echoed by the tiny pennant banner affixed to the back of his cuirass, affirmed his allegiance to Averland. A helmet, its visor raised, sat upon his head, and failed to hide his thinning ginger hair. A broadsword sat in a scabbard at his waist, which slapped against the man's bulging thigh in time with his wobbling jowls. Prince Wilhelm! exclaimed the baron, throwing out an arm in over-enthusiastic greeting. It does my heart good to see that Reichland has not abandoned its brothers. The prince rode ahead of the army with Ledner, Preceptor Cogswald, and a small contingent of Griffin Corps. Ernst, the prince replied. The man was known to Wilhelm. They had attended imperial functions together at the Emperor's palace in Nuln. Baron Blaislocker was a toady, a lower-ranked noble, who sought to improve his station by association. More than once he had tried to court the prince's favor with offers of banquets or rides through his lands around the town of Streisen. Wilhelm had refused every one, politely, of course. Emperor Dieter's functions were a trial he had no choice but to bear. Blaislocker's company was not. Had he been able to choose his allies, Wilhelm would have placed the baron near the bottom of a long list. But such luxuries were not available to him. Every sword was welcome to the cause, even blaze lockers. To his credit, the baron had brought a decent-sized force with him. True to Preceptor Cogswald's word, there were a number of temple knights alongside the foot-slogging state troops. Wilhelm didn't recognize the order, but judged them to be Sigmarite given the blazing comet device on their shields and banner. The rest of the army comprised spearmen and crossbows, with a few free companies. It was about a third the size of Wilhelm's force. A large army to escort a noble of my mere stature, the baron said when he saw the marching column of men behind the prince's small entourage. Wilhelm's brow furrowed. You misunderstand, Ernst. We aren't here to escort you anywhere. We marched to Averheim to try and lift the siege. The baron's ruddy face paled at once. We... what? The good humor vanished, and his hands started to tremble a little. We marched to Averheim, and so do you, asserted Wilhelm. Now tell me, how bad are the things in the capital? What forces do we face? The baron swallowed deeply and started to shake his head. No, oh, no, no, he blathered. You don't want to go there. We should head west to Reichland. I'm sure the emperor will grant us protection in Null. The emperor has moved west himself already and resides at Daltorf, snapped Ledner. You'll find no protection there. No. Do as your prince bids before I smack you off that horse, you fat oaf. As quickly as it came, Ledner's anger subsided, leaving Blaislocker dumbstruck. Speak to me, Ernst, said the prince. Tell me what you know, and do it now. Keller shook the dirt and stones from his boot, sitting by the side of the road, then trying not to lift his gaze from the ground. 
He had been seeing things in the shadows, in the lee of trees, at the crest of hills, in the cool quiet of valleys. During the march from Blostadt, he had noticed a shape flitting occasionally at the edge of his vision. But when he went to catch it, the shape had gone, evaporated like mist before the hot sun. He knew what it was, and begged for it to stop, before telling himself to get a grip on his senses. The shadow didn't listen. It dogged him every step he took. It haunted his every waking thought, and came again, as a much more grisly apparition, not merely a shadow at all, in his nightmares. Even now, basking in the glory of the midday sun, while the regiments from Averland were integrated into the order of march, he felt it. There, at his shoulder, he perched, like a harbinger of killer's own inexorable fate, his penance. Thankfully, none of the other Grimblades had noticed, at least not yet. They rested briefly in a grassy plain, with a few dotted trees, and near a shallow stream. It was a minor tributary of the mighty Aver, which was visible as a glittering silver-blue band in the distance. Almost as long and wide as the Reich, the river was an impressive sight. Ordinarily, skiffs and boats would ply its depths for trade and passage across. The Aver was strangely empty this day, and had been for several days before it. Even the river birds, the fishermen, and water-borne creatures were few and far between. It was as if life had ceased to be along its banks, as if the river were abandoned in the face of the greenskin invasion, its own refugee columns passing unheeded in the night. Rex stretched his legs, and rubbed at the fading wound in his shoulder. He winced, but the pain was not nearly as bad as it had been. It had been a long march from Reichland, and now, closing on Averheim and the enemy, the soldiers of the Empire were starting to feel it. Even Volker, a seasoned ranger and hunter, used to trekking the wilds, rubbed at his back and grimaced. How much further to Averheim? said Rex. Though he asked no one in particular, Lenkman took it upon himself to answer. Another thirty miles or so? Just over the next rise. He pointed to the distant horizon. And we should see it. From there, I'd guess a day's march, maybe two. Are you keen for a fight or something, Thorsten? Asked Volker of the drummer. Not especially, but anything is preferable to this. Maybe Eber could carry you, laughed the Reichland hunter one eye on Dog, who was scurrying around the long grasses, chasing imagined prey. Strap a cart onto his back and we could all travel in relative comfort, scoffed Rex, before leaping onto Eber's broad back. To Averheim, beast of burden, he cried. The big halberdier laughed loudly, seizing Rex's ankles and then dumping him to the ground. This beast is not for riding said Eber, helping the drummer back to his feet, who was rubbing his sore rump. By now, most of the Grimblades were laughing. Even Lankman managed to snigger. It was a welcome relief after the somberness of Berviter's death. Brand was nowhere to be seen, having wandered off. Likely he was sharpening his blades by the edge of the stream, where a good number of soldiers were dunking their heads and washing their filthy pits or refilling skins, the latter seemingly unbothered by what the former were doing in their future drinking water. Keller, Masbrecht began, noticing the downturned face of his comrade. Are you all right? Not in the mood for banter? If you wish, I can bless you with... Go away, hissed Keller, risking a glance at the lonely tree a little way in the distance. Its limbs were swaying, as if beckoning, and the leaf cascaded forlornly from one of its branches. Leave me alone, please. Sorry, brother, I didn't mean to cause offense, said Masbrecht, and walked away to join the rest. When he was gone, 
Keller looked up. What? He asked of Masbrecht's departing back, only just realizing he hadn't been alone. Karlick had a sour look on his face as he returned to the regiment and his men. He'd been listening to one of Prince Wilhelm's messengers, who related some change in orders directly from a scroll. The sergeant had neglected to even look at the parchment, let alone keep it, and instead nodded curtly to the runner, before showing him his back and walking away. News doesn't look good, whispered Rex. Even from behind him, Masbrecht could smell the alcohol on the drummer's breath, but chose to hold his tongue. It awakened something in him, an old dependency, and desire he thought was long buried. Clenching his jaw, Masbrecht pushed it back down into the deep places of his soul, where it belonged. Lankman, standing rod straight alongside the Grimblade drummer, failed to notice Rex's booze breath. His gaze was fixed on Karlik. It will be what it will be, he replied. We'll perform our duty all the same. Definitely not good, hissed Volker. They were back in formation and arrayed in column with the Averland regiments. A few of the officers had received messages from the prince, and the army was awaiting their return to the ranks before marching on to Averheim. Who is that overstuffed peacock riding behind him? asked Keller. His voice was a little hoarse. He'd barely spoken at all in days. They all saw the corpulent noble atop his stubby-legged steed, swaying behind Karlik. Even mounted, the man was slower than the Grimblade sergeant by a good two strides. Karlik reached the men first, as the noble slowed, and then came to a stop a few regiments ahead of them, next to von Rauken's Karaburg few. The stern great sworder champion looked about as pleased as Karlik to be in the mounted noble's presence, but then his mood was perpetually dour. Sergeant, said Lankman, addressing Karlik with a clipped salute. You're probably wondering who that is, began Karlik, not deigning to wait for questions. It's Baron Ernst Blaislocker of Streisand. His Averland regiments are the reason for our swelled forces. Why is he riding with us? asked Volker. He has replaced Captain Stoller, Brand replied, prompting a glance over the shoulder from Karlik. Is he leading us now, then? asked Rex, failing to keep the disappointment out of his voice. Karlik was stoic in response. The Baron has command of the Reich and Averland foot, until such time as Captain Stoller is fit to retake the field. And how long will that be? asked Masbrecht. How am I to know? snapped Karlik. I have yet to visit the Kirurgeon's tent and inquire after the Captain. His screams suggest it will not be before we reach Averheim, if at all. Let's hope it's soon mumbled Volker. I heard that. Volker bowed his head contritely at the sergeant's reprimand. Tender mercies of Shalia, can he even fight? hissed Lankman, as surprised as anyone at his own impropriety. Karlik knew something of the noble who now led them. He'd heard talk in the Averland camp, and knew that some called him the Yellow Baron and not on account of his allegiance to the province either. Together with the appearance of the witch-hunter, Stoller's injury, and now this, it was turning into an arduous campaign. Karlik sighed. It was a question to which he suspected he knew the answer already, but, for the sake of morale, chose not to voice. Instead, he replied with as much tact as he could muster. We'll find out soon enough. 